Uh, I think if the public had any knowledge of the amount of engineering work and the amount of licensing rigor, the amount of testing, I think people's concern would very quickly go away when anything has to do with, with spent fuel. The gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. Hello, Amir. Thank you so much for joining me on Tides of Nuclear. It's such a pleasure to have you on here. Good morning. How are you today? Uh, it's been we've been trying to organize this for quite a while now, so I'm very excited that we finally have this all set up. And uh, before we get into our conversation, could you just uh, do a brief introduction to the audience and tell them about how you first got into the nuclear industry? Sure. Thank you for that opportunity. So uh, my name is Amir Vexler. I'm the president of Orano TN Americas. Um, I've had a long journey in the nuclear career. And uh, starting really from, from the beginning, I, uh, I'm a graduated, um, I graduated as a mechanical engineer from the University of Toronto in Canada. Um, I really worked in several industries as an engineer before I got into the nuclear industry about 20 years ago. Uh, and the way I got into it was I was hired by General Electric in Toronto. I don't know how many people know this, but uh, General Electric um, used to have a, um, a large footprint, nuclear footprint, in the Canadian can-do market. In fact, the facility and the business that I joined was one of the uh, developers of the can-do fuel uh, manufacturing technology. So that's where I started um, about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago. And I kind of progressed through the ranks uh, into plant management. I managed uh, most of the licensed plants that, that GE had in Canada. And that's what got me into the U.S. because GE had a large um, nuclear organization in the U.S. as well. So I managed to, uh, to, to work in, in a lot of our operations and manage a lot of our nuclear operations here in the U.S. And in 2015, I became the CEO of, um, of Global Nuclear Fuels, which you probably know is the uh, joint venture back then of um, Hitachi, GE, and Toshiba. And I did that till 2019. And in 2019, um, I, I moved to Orano and um, I was appointed the president of Orano TN in 2019. Congratulations on that. Uh, so I, 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 I'm always very curious to know, when you first got into the nuclear industry, what was the, uh, the public response to the nuclear industry at that time? What was your personal response? Was it something you were very aware of and was it something you were excited to get into? Or was, did you just find yourself there and just kind of learned the importance as you went along? Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that. I kind of remember that a few days ago when I was uh, talking to a friend of mine. Um, I was working in the chemical industry when I got an interview with General Electric and I didn't even realize that there is a nuclear facility in Toronto. That facility was was uh, close to downtown <laughs> and it was making nuclear fuel. Actually, it's still there. And so my perception was, how is that even possible? Who would put a nuclear facility uh, downtown large city? Uh, but I got to tell you, my, my perception got completely changed when I actually started working there because I came from a chemical industry and uh, we near we did not nearly have the kind of controls that the nuclear industry has over worker safety and public safety. Uh, in fact, I remember my first day on the job, uh, they sent me to do a full body count, a lung count. And I was driving there with a gentleman that was retiring the same day that I was hired. And he worked in that nuclear facility his entire life. He was over 60 years old. And when we drove there, um, 
he and I were talking. So that was my first day, his last day. And first of all, I couldn't believe he's 60 years old. He looked like he was 40 years old. And I think he was healthier than I was in my 20s <laughs> back then. And so I think my perception and generally the perception back then was basically what you read in the newspaper and the media, some of the hyped up rhetoric about nuclear. But that really has changed for me in a matter of a few hours of being there and, and seeing the kind of controls that were in the facility. And, you know, as time went on and, you know, having the perspective of an operations leader and a business leader, I, I, I just view that as we're second to no other industry in terms of protecting the public and, you know, protecting our employees. It doesn't matter what company you are in the nuclear industry. We all take it very seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is such a great response. And now at Orano, you are very deep into the nuclear industry and you are in the value chain. So I'll, I'll let you take it. So what does Orano do and what, what, what services does it specialize on? So uh, again, I, I kind of joked with somebody the other day. I said I went from being um, a midwife to being a funeral director. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was in the business of designing, making fuel, and now... Really, I'm, I'm proud to be part of Orano because we have sort of a turnkey, uh, the full integrated supply chain that starts with the moment that a utility offloads their fuel into the spent fuel pool. I mean, from that point on, we can take over, provide all the services uh, to load it into dry fuel storage, to manage the, uh, you know, the storage pads at the sites, um, to do preventive maintenance work and you know we can provide and we have manufacturing facilities where we manufacture all the hardware the canister the storage units and um, now in fact um, around the USA is, is part of that uh, part of this expansion of the scope is looking at things like interim storage consolidated interim storage of, of uh, uh, dry fuel or spent fuel so basically Everything from spent fuel pool down to semi-permanent storage of nuclear fuel. Mm. Um, is it fair to say that this this part of the nuclear value chain is where the public and especially some environmentalists have the uh, least amount of information and the most amount of opinion on? Is that is that a fair assessment to make? Yeah, uh, I think I think the media, movies. Uh, Cartoons have done us no no favors in that it's just a complete exaggeration of, of what this business is about. Uh, I think if the public had any knowledge of the amount of engineering work and the amount of licensing rigor, the amount of testing, the amount of quality control that goes into fabricating, installing, servicing, and maintaining a dry fuel storage system, I think people's concern would very quickly go away when anything has to do with, with spent fuel. Um, you know, so, some of the stuff, I mean, all this stuff is really designed. I mean, our systems are designed and built even beyond design basis for things like seismic and, and floods. And so we've, um, it's pretty impressive when you look at it. You know, when I came in and, and I knew fuel, but did not know spent fuel that much. I was extremely impressed with the level, of the rigor in which we design and, and build these systems. So to answer your question, I think that it's an easy one to pick on because you don't really need to know anything. You just can point to cartoons and, and say, well, it's got to be dangerous. But the, the, the reality of it is, you know, at that point, the, the, the fuel can do very little damage in terms of har harming the environment or the public. That's, that's just a general statement that I'll make. Hmm, okay. So uh, going a bit deeper on this, what are the unique challenges that you've seen? Because I think you have a unique perspective because you're just coming into it and you just seeing how everything is. You don't have uh, 20 years of experience on this. So just coming into it, what are the challenges you see that you found so far in the uh, spent fuel management sector? Um, you know, that's, that, that's a good question. And... Um, Looking at it as, as a business person first, um, I would say that uh, you touched on it right away, the, the public misconception regarding the safety aspect of the spent fuel. 
I think that's number one, a, a, a huge headwind that the entire industry and that we have in the spent fuel management sector. You know, people just reflexively would say no to anything that has to do with this, even, even if there's no rationale behind it. Um, you know, I think some of these attitudes have stopped us from from delaying and securing a national repository. I think all members of public understand that and know that that does not help our, our, our industry. And quite frankly, I don't know that it helps just our society in general, um, some of the politics that's wrapped around it. So I think that probably is probably the biggest challenge, the, the public misconception. Um, the other one that I'll mention to you, and, and, and I'm learning this fairly quickly, is misconception by customers as well, the utilities that somehow dry fuel storage is a commodity. You know, we, we do have competitors um, and, and I'm very careful to ensure we don't go down the path of commoditization of dry fuel storage because they're not all equal. Um, there's, there's definite advantages, like for example, we are the only ones that have a horizontal uh, dry fuel storage system or new home system. It is unique in, in its ability to, you know, um, remove heat, uh, its ability in its defense and depth in terms of things like accident scenarios, like tip, tip overs. That's not a concern in our systems. So th these are just some of the examples that, that I think there is an attempt to commoditize a lot of these things. And we as a company have to be um, just very thoughtful about how we design, how we license, and how we interact with customers around this aspect of their operations. I mean, think about it. U utilities typically at that stage, um, nu spent nuclear fuel does not add a lot of efficiencies to their operation. It's not anything they, they generate revenue on. Uh, at that point, it becomes a liability more than anything else. And so there is this, um, there's this temptation to view it just strictly as a liability and uh, as a commodity. So we have to work very hard to make sure that that doesn't happen because there are very clear and distinct differentiators. Mm, okay. Um, would you mind going a bit deeper on what those differentiators are, if you don't mind? Yeah, absolutely. So, so if you think about it, and I'll, I'll try to simplify it very much, everybody else has a vertical system where, you know, they load the, the fuel assemblies the spent fuel assemblies vertically into their systems and that really is how it's stored on on the pad um, at the utility side um, ours is different ours is loaded horizontally handled horizontally uh, at any point in time from its loading phase it's in an overpack so the actual canister is not exposed at any point in time so if there is an accident scenario of, of, of something falling or the canister being lost control of, ours is way more protected in that handling, you know, chain of custody, if you will, until, to, until the point where it's inserted into, its, um, into the horizontal storage module. And so um, that's number one. Number two, just from a heat removal standpoint, I mean, you gotta understand these, these fuel assemblies and the systems are, are, are still, still hot for a little while. And so there has to be an ability to remove the heat. When you store a unit horizontally, there is more effective heat removal because you're able to get cooler air to the center um, of the unit as opposed to the vertical, which kind of goes through the entire system and you don't get the most cooling effect to the center of the system in a vertical system. Um, and probably the biggest one that, that we really are proud of is, is a defense in depth, stability. So think about seismic events. You have a huge system that sits vertically. Um, you can imagine certain accident scenarios would tip over in a vertical system. And by the way, that's probably one of the worst things that, that everybody tries to protect from is the, um, the tip over and kind of loss of control over the SNM. Um, in our particular case, it's already tipped over, it's vertical. And so, uh, sorry, it's horizontal. And so there, there, that takes away that concern. So there is that defense in depth. Um, and, and in my opinion, that, that's probably 
the biggest one that 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 people need to be very mindful of. Mm, okay, and I guess we can talk about spend few management without because you 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 kind of mentioned it earlier quite briefly when you talked about a more permanent solution to this. And in the USA, there's there, there was a lot of talk about uh, the the UK matter repository. So that has been a very long conversation, and it's still developing, even though it's not really going as what as many people want it. So, what are your thoughts on having a long term solution to uh, nuclear waste in the USA? Yeah, well, un unfortunately, um, I'll try to re refrain from making political statements. And unfortunately, that issue has been politicized. And uh, the reason why it was allowed to be to be politicized is because the lack of education of the general public. So, I mean, I, I believe I'm just stating simple facts. Um, so, it, I mean, obviously, in my opinion, as, as a taxpayer, as a citizen, um, it makes most sense to have a central repository for, for this spent nuclear fuel. From a practical standpoint, history has shown us that, that it may not happen that quickly. I mean, they've been working on it for a long time, and this may not be a reality for a long time. And so um, we're, we're taking the next step that, in my opinion, is probably the most pragmatic and, and the cleverest thing to do and probably the brings, brings the most value to, to taxpayers, citizens, and, and you know, just generally all the stakeholders is to create a consolidated interim storage facility, you know, where instead of each utility storing their own spent fuel on their sites, create a consolidated facility that does that. Uh, the reason why it makes absolute sense to me, again, looking at it as a, as a member of a public and I'm looking at it as a taxpayer and as a business person, there is huge economies of scale of managing a large inventory of spent fuel versus many teams managing smaller pools of inventory all across the country. Mm. So this is something that we're working towards in uh, in Texas as well through some partnerships. When I say we, I'm referring to Orano USA. Okay. And we're we're supporting Orano TM is supporting it, and as part of the team. Okay. Um, do you think that the framework exists right now for that kind of a collaborative effort to have a facility like that and to have programs like that going forward, or it's something that needs to be built up? Yeah, that's that's a good question because. Um, the things that you don't think are problems do become problems. Uh, so I, I do think that the framework exists. I don't think we are as advanced in certain things as, uh, let's say, the Europeans are. Uh, I'll give you an example in a minute. Uh, I think some of the obstacles to creating that infrastructure is, I think, number one, um, public opinion. The public has to realize that uh, there is minimal risk, if any, associated with that kind of storage scheme because at that point the fuel is cool. I mean, even th there's very little that actually can happen at that point. Um, and in some of the areas that I think need to be very carefully invested in is the transport. You know, we, we don't have a lot of precedents in this country in transporting um, spent nuclear fuel be it trucks or be it railway or barges. So that, that becomes a very key component of this consolidated storage idea. Uh, so to answer your question, I think that we, we are building that infrastructure now. And for example, in Europe, it's already developed, it's already rehearsed, it's been done so many times. And this is, and this is where some of our value as Orano comes as well, because we have a huge parent company in Orano, uh, TN in, in France and in Europe, and that is really a matter, all these transport events are a matter of routine. They have a, uh, you know, an emergency preparedness center that is manned around the clock when these happen. And, and so there's a lot that, that we leverage from them and learn from them and make sure we put in practice here when that happens. Hmm. And kind of going back to um, what you said, uh, I don't want us to get into too much in, into the politics of it, but you mentioned that it m most of the issue around spent nuclear fuel or 
energy in general these days has been very politicized and there are a lot of reasons for that you have uh, the movement for climate change environmentalists and you have generally some policies that try to counter each other at sometimes counterproductive measures but this is the reality that most energy companies have to deal with right now especially when you're in the value chain where people don't really know enough and you can't really escape that because since they don't know enough of what the core business is and what the challenges are and what the benefits are it makes it very difficult to have that conversation because sometimes people are just not li willing to listen. And have you, have you come across that sometime when you're speaking with people? Because I can imagine having a conversation about what you do could turn into pretty interesting, interesting discussions. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that's you actually are asking a you're asking a very good question here because um, I, I do see that that some people are are very close-minded when it comes to stuff like that um, and I think what's driving close-mindedness is the lack of education and understanding of what what really generates power in this country and what provides grid stability and what provides you know just the comforts the everyday comforts that that, that people are are used to um, so in, in my opinion I think and nothing will be done without properly educating the public and I'm drawing from from my experience from the past um, I've managed several licensed facilities that process a, a special nuclear facility uh, special nuclear material and the neighbors kind of knew we were there and they had uh, real apprehensions about having a facility next door to them and um, their perception of what we do over there was we make bombs or we make things that can seriously harm people. Um, once people, once we invited people to open houses, once we held open houses with neighbors and even toured people through what we do, I think people tend to agree that this is this is minimal risk. I I, I see working at any other plant as being a higher risk issue as a, to the environment or to the neighborhood than actually working in a nuclear facility like I'm describing. So in my opinion, an education campaign um, has to be very important. And I think DNEI is, is doing a decent job at it, particularly in the last, I'd say, five years or so, utilizing social media. I mean, I, I see it all the time, just the general education that's being put out there. But I think we just need to do a little more. You know, um, I. I the recent developments, you, you saw the government throwing its weight behind U.S. nuclear leadership in the world. I honestly don't know how we could be uh, leaders out there in the world without having the ability to fully close that nuclear fuel cycle. Um, you know, I'm not even talking about the ability to recycle some of that fuel that is that other countries for example, France has the ability to do that. They do that. In, they utilize that. Utilize it in Japan. Um, I mean, we're we really are not that advanced when it comes to that. And um, I think we, if we truly mean to be leaders out there in the nuclear industry, we got to be able to address the entire fuel cycle, including storage, possibly recycling as well. Mm -hmm. And how? How early do you think this education needs to start? Because this is, this is something that I've heard quite a lot in my interviews and just in conversations with people in the nuclear industry because um, the example you gave about having open houses, because once people see, once they actually get the right information and they, and they see it in practice and someone explains to them what the benefits are, their, op their opinions tend to change very quickly because it's very hard to have biases in your mind when you have evidence very firmly put in front of you. So how, how early do you think it's best to start having these conversations before they, they learn from, from, from cartoons and from exaggerated news articles that tell them not, not necessarily the right things that they should be learning? Yeah, I can tell you what I think is most impactful. I am not certain is the most effective just because of the numbers. I think the most impactful, and I've seen this firsthand, is when people that work in our industry or people that live close to where we operate, they become the advocates in educating their neighbors, their coworkers, um, their church members, 
Um, and I've seen this firsthand when somebody that is completely uneducated says something like, oh, is that the place over there where you guys make dangerous nuclear bombs? Uh, and, you know, people say, no, I work on the line and I'm probably safer than any other worker that I know out there. And, and the public is as well. That to me is, is probably the most impactful way to, to impact opinion, public opinion. I'm not sure how effective it is because there's just so many people that work in that industry or have firsthand knowledge of, of, of what we do. So somehow we as an industry have to figure out how to educate. I think social media has gone huge for us. It has done really well for us. I, I've seen opinions change. You know, we back 20 years ago, you wouldn't buy a spot on TV to advertise the nuclear industry. Um, you just wouldn't do it. But now, I mean, you know, you go on Facebook or LinkedIn and there are 20 second snippet videos that are posted by a lot of nuclear companies and, and people kind of learn and see, oh, is this how it's done? That's neat. You know, a place where I worked before, we even posted uh, sort of a video from inside how workers work with the material, what protective equipment they have. I mean, the comments that people had, oh, wow, I didn't realize it was so clean in there. I didn't realize it was so organized. <laughs> you know, if your point, when people watch The Simpsons, they think that there's green goo, you know, <laughs> falling off the ceiling or pipes. So I think it's it's... We, we have to be, as an industry, we have to be very proactive in doing that. And uh, like I said, I think things have improved dramatically. Um, if, if you compare the sentiment in the U.S. in general to the sentiment, say, in Europe when it comes to nuclear power, I, I, think, we're, I think we're a little more fortunate that way, in my opinion. But we still need to work at it. I think there's still a lot of work. Okay. And... Uh... You're still in your first year at Orano TN, and there's a lot of uh, projects that I'm sure you're working on, lots of things that you want to get into. Uh, obviously, the lockdown is kind of putting most things on hold, but uh, going into the future now, what are, the, what are your main priorities to just go in, like things you really want to get, your, get stuck in and things you really want to see develop during your care at Orano TN? Yeah, that's a good question. So. Uh... I'll answer it just from my personal view as opposed to um, sort of what the company needs to do, although they're both one and the same when I really think about it. Um, I've always believed and uh, my mantra has always been that in order to be successful in the industry, it doesn't matter whether you're, the, whether you're a utility or a supplier to utility, whether you're in fuel and services whatever it is you provide to a utility if, if you're part of this industry there's really two things that that you got to be able to deliver in order to be at the top of your game first and foremost is technology you have to be a technology leader this is a fast evolving industry now when i say technology i'm talking about a customer a utility has to derive value from what you've created if it's the same old and you're not evolving your product, you're not introducing more benefits and more value to the customer, I'd say you're gonna lag behind and you're probably not gonna be in business for too long. So te technological leadership has to be a priority and it is a priority for me. Number two, um, not far behind in terms of importance, there has to be a strong cost position in the market. Um, a lot of our customers, I'd say most of our customers, if not all of them, have cost pressures. I mean, particularly now, post the, the virus, and I mean, they've they had a significant impact to their revenues. Uh, I'm not even talking about the ones that are in the deregulated market that have merchant fleets. They have extreme cost challenges. We have to find a way to be cost competitive, and we have to find a way to transfer that cost competitiveness to our customers. Um, you know, I attended once a, a conference years ago and we were people were talking about um, the nuclear promise. And that conference really represented the entire supply chain to the to the utilities. And one of the executive, you know, I gave a speech about the nuclear promise and what we need to do as a supply chain to, to the new to the utilities. And I said we gotta be able to deliver. And I think the goal was something like 30% cost out. 
Uh, somebody stood up, one of the executives stood up and says, well, I don't really think it's realistic. I don't think it can ever be done. I think this is just a pipe dream. Uh, my response to him was, it has to be done. If the utilities do not generate profit, if they're not a competitive mode of power generation out there, we as an industry are going to be doomed in general. So I, I do believe that, that cost positioning in the supply chain, and we're part of the supply chain, has to be a priority. And I think that needs to be transferred as a benefit to our utility customers who have extreme pressures of their own. Hmm. So these are the two things that these are the two things that are on my mind after the first year. Yeah. Those are very strong priorities to have uh, for any organization, not just for nuclear. And uh, a lot of things have happened this year. O obviously, we can't ignore things like politically and in terms of the environment and in terms of business as well. But uh, I think there, there always has to be a sort of looking forward. Uh, I think that's also very important, a bit of optimism, if you will. Because I don't think you can be in the nuclear industry without being a bit optimistic <laughs> about what the future holds, because I think it helps. <laughs> I think it's very important. So uh, what are you most excited for, for the future of nuclear? What do you want to see um, go up in terms of te technology or in terms of public opinion? Um, what's... What's, what just excites you in the next few years for the nuclear industry? Yeah, so I'll, um, the one thing that, that, you know, I think we as an industry, we hit a big slump in 2011 uh, post Fukushima events. I think that was a very, that was a watershed event for the entire industry. A lot of new builds were, were impacted. Uh, the industry just, just contracted significantly and quickly almost overnight. Um, I think that allowed a lot of competition from abroad, from sort of like state um, assisted companies and enterprises to take a lot of leadership in the world market when it comes to nuclear. Uh, so what's exciting to me is I'm finally seeing a turnaround um, just from a governmental level where everybody throws their full weight behind the nuclear industry and saying we have to be a competitive industry out in the world there's benefits that by far exceed just jobs in the u.s although that's that's a great advantage and a great benefit i mean there, there's a lot of political reasons why we want to be leaders in the nuclear supply world that's just a simple statement i think generally there's that recognition finally now so I think the Department of Energy had, I've never seen that much support from the Department of Energy to the various projects and the development of the new generation of reactors. I'm sure you're aware of that. That probably is the most exciting thing for anybody in the industry is to see something in terms of generation being built. So, uh, you know, I think they're sponsoring a lot of development and licensing of that technology, which is exciting. I'll be completely ecstatic when I see, you know, private companies putting the first orders for these reactors and the entire supply chain, which includes us getting activated and, and, and on executing on it. So that's one thing that, that makes me really excited about what I'm seeing and I'm looking forward to that. But uh, there's another aspect to it that um, having been in this for over 20 years, I've seen seen slowly a decline in the younger generation's interest in, in this industry. Um, particularly after 2011, I mean, there's people that, that work with me and their kids go to college and you hear things like, well, I would never want my son or daughter to go into nuclear engineering. You know, I'd rather they go study industrial or biomechanical or, and I started hearing more and more of that in the last 10 years or so or nine years um, and that kind of makes you sad a little bit for somebody who spent their entire life in that industry I'm, I'm noticing that things are starting to change as programs being funded as as you know new projects are being initiated by the different companies I think it creates a lot of excitement in the industry and that projects itself to the younger generation that looks to make a career in this industry so you know, my kids are college age and, you know, I'm, 
I'm hearing more and more of their friends being curious and asking, well, what is a career like in the nuclear world? And uh, that, that's exciting to me as well. You know, to me, younger generation getting into this and making more impactful decisions and being more creative than we were and coming up with new ways of doing things that perhaps we were not able to, that to me is, is, is the ultimate excitement. Very well put. Amir Vexa, thank you so much for joining me on the Tides of Nuclear. It's been great having you as a guest. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversation. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress toward peace.